gas heat exchangers. Uh, what is a heat exchanger? A heat exchanger is a furnace. In a furnace is a chamber where the heat of combustion is transferred to the surrounding area. Heat exchangers are sealed to prevent any combustion gas from mixing with the air that will be circulated through the conditioned area. Okay, so heat exchangers have a couple of jobs to do. Uh, the heat exchanger is probably is the most important part in the uh, life and death uh, situation when it comes to uh, gas heat and and how they operate. They are the only part in there that heats the circulated area in the conditioned space, and it is the only part in there that will actually carry the combustion gases to the flue pipe where it can now be released to the outdoors. Heat exchangers should be inspected for damage, cracks, so on and so forth on every maintenance and on every service call that is being performed on a particular piece of equipment. Heat exchangers have and are characterized in two different uh, uh, categorizations here. You got a primary heat exchanger and you have a secondary heat exchanger. Okay, the primary heat exchanger is what is connected directly to the combustion chamber and transfers sensible heat from its surface to the air circulating through the conditioned space. Your primary heat exchanger can be constructed from a variety of different materials that are out there. Uh, they could be stain, uh, stainless steel. Uh, I do believe some of them are stamped aluminum. Uh, some of them, uh, there's a whole bunch of different ones that are actually out there. And can be constructed from a variety of materials that provide different rates of heat transfer. So here we are, we have an example of your primary heat exchanger and your secondary heat exchanger. This was taken out of a 95% efficient gas-fired furnace. Your primary heat exchanger, this is actually the heat exchanger where the flame actually uh, comes into. So this is the, the big guy that does a majority of the work. The secondary heat exchanger which is down here, if you kind of see it, it almost kind of looks like a coil. This is where we pick up the additional heat, and this is the coil that actually provides for that additional uh, efficiency that we are now seeing in a lot of our furnaces, because now it has a much bigger surface area for the, for the air to actually pass through, and we're able to pick up that additional heat. So efficiency, high efficiency furnaces are equipped with that secondary heat exchanger. The secondary heat exchanger is attached to the primary heat exchanger and transfers sensible and latent heat from the combustion gases to the circulated air. Older and more traditional furnaces, they didn't have secondary heat exchangers. They only had the primary heat exchanger, which is why they had such lower efficiency. Okay, your traditional furnaces would quickly exhaust the combustion gases and lose some of its heating potential out the flue, which made them less efficient. And these furnaces used older style, what we would call clamshell type heat exchangers. Your clam style heat exchangers were basically two pieces of metal that were formed and then kind of like welded or stamped together. They came from the factory with some leakage some of them about 5%, believe it or not, even though we want to try to eliminate the combustion gases from entering the, the space, your older style furnaces did come with a little bit of a leak, and some of those gases did actually make their way into the space. The pressure created by the blower motor keeps the flue gases in the heat exchanger and out of the space. One of the biggest problems with these types of heat exchangers is that if we overfired or the the furnace they failed relatively quickly 
Okay, you can actually see in this picture here some of the damage that can occur from an overfired heat exchanger. You can, if you look right in this particular area right here, you see how this discoloration is. That is a sign of heat stress. The, that heat exchanger was actually being overfired, which means that the flame was getting shot through here and the flame was actually too large and was kind of almost like reaching around and doing a a loop here and this was actually over firing that piece of equipment you can also see a little bit of damage right here from your from that over firing when you look at a, a heat exchanger you don't want to see too much discoloration you really don't want to see a lot of rust or any sort of deformity in the metal it should relatively look in decent condition your condensing furnaces, those guys have a fuel utilization efficiency of above 90% today. These furnaces differ from your traditional furnaces simply due to the fact that they have a primary and secondary heat exchanger in them. Okay, condensing furnaces, the heat is extracted for a longer period of time until the combustion gases gives up the heat from the start to the finish, which is why we have a condensing furnace. Remember, on your condensing furnaces, your flue gases are like 100 degrees. In some cases, maybe even 90 degrees. The reason why we're able to achieve that is through that secondary heat exchanger. The air is passing through that heat exchanger portion of the furnace longer. And then by doing so, we're able to pick up that additional heat and put it into the space. How does it happen? Well, the combustion gases pass through the primary heat exchanger and then into the secondary heat exchanger. And in these furnaces, the circulated air passes over the heat exchanger in the opposite direction of the combustion gases. And the air passes over the heat exchanger, secondary heat exchanger first, and then the primary heat exchanger. So when the air passes over that secondary heat exchanger first, it is able to absorb the maximum amount of heat possible. Because remember, the secondary heat exchanger looks like an evaporator coil. It looks like a condenser coil. It has more surface area, which is that latent heat is then released from the combustion gases as it is now condensed. It is then passes over the primary heat exchanger where it now absorbs even more of the heat that is being generated. The heat is removed from the combustion gases until it now condenses. Since condensing furnaces have lower flue temperatures, we are now able to use PVC or CPVC to uh, vent out the, the gases into uh, a chimney or into a metal flue pipe or however the the construction is going to be. A lot of your 95% furnaces are going to not be um, installed through a chimney or into a metal flue pipe. They're going to have their own uh, point of exit in a home and that could be either through a roof or through the side of a building. Okay, most gas-fired or condensing furnaces are uh, gas-fired. There really is no oil-fired type uh, condensing furnaces at this point. Your non-condensing furnaces, those guys are going to have an efficiency rating of somewhere around 70%. Okay, and they will utilize what we call a drum-style heat exchanger. They are not manufactured anymore, but some may still exist. Uh, your drum style heat exchangers almost looks like a gigantic 55 gallon drum. The fire and combustion gases are inside that type of uh, heat exchanger. And in the space or the conditioned air blows across the outside of them. Uh, these furnaces have a non-condensing gas furnace. They are going to have an efficiency rating of anywhere between 80 and 90 percent. Uh, I do believe most of them are somewhere like 85 to like 89 percent efficient. They are also have a single heat exchanger that transfers heat from the combustion gases to the circulated air in the space. And the combustion gases are vented to a flue or chimney 
with a flu liner and can have up to about 20% of the heat being generated lost out the chimney. Okay, so these furnaces are, they're good, but they could be better. Okay. Before each heating season, every heat exchanger needs to be checked for cracks. Okay. There, there's several ways of checking a heat exchanger for, for cracks. Uh, one way is honestly taking out the blower in the furnace and physically getting underneath the furnace with a flashlight and a mirror and physically uh, checking the heat exchanger for cracks. You can use uh, a carbon monoxide detector at your um, supply vents in the room uh, to see if you're getting any carbon monoxide readings coming out of the vents. Uh, you can do an actual pressure test on, the, on heat exchangers. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. But carbon monoxide can seep through cracks in the heat exchanger and into the conditioned space. That is the main reason why we want to check heat exchangers for cracks. We don't want that carbon monoxide to get into the living space. Okay, if a cracked heat exchanger is found, it must be replaced. You cannot repair it, and it cannot be ignored. Okay, we have a job to do. Remember, we are the ones that are servicing and inspecting these, these pieces of equipment. And in this trade, there is one rule that we always follow, and that is you are the last one to touch it, you own it. So which means that if you are the last one there and you worked on it and that heat exchanger had a crack and you didn't see it or you didn't do it and that person gets hurt, killed, or what have you, you're the one that's going to have to answer the questions as to why you didn't do what you were supposed to do when you were supposed to do it. So be careful when diagnosing a cracked heat exchanger. You have to document everything. Okay? If you have to, use your camera phone. Use your phone. Take a picture of the heat exchanger if needed. And if in any doubt, get another technician from your company to give you a second opinion. It doesn't hurt to have a second pair of eyes on some stuff too to say hey look you know what maybe I don't know uh, it looks like a crack what do you think send a picture to your boss you know send a picture to a fellow technician hey I'm over here what do you think does it look like a, a crack what do you think okay crack heat exchangers most often mean a replacement of a furnace chances are now, in a residential setting, if you have a cracked heat exchanger, you're probably going to wind up just simply replacing the whole furnace. Uh, there are going to be times out there where that's not going to be the case. You're actually going to take out the heat exchanger in the furnace and put a brand new one in. Uh, it depends on the homeowner. It depends on the scenario. But, you know, you, you, it depends on what's going to happen. They do not crack on their own, though, okay? A heat exchanger is going to crack for a reason. It is our job to figure out what caused that problem. If the furnace is firing properly, our gas pressures are right, our airflow across the heat exchanger is where it's supposed to be, the heat exchanger should not crack or should not fail, okay? We need to find that problem so that it doesn't happen again. Okay, problems that will cause for a heat exchanger to prematurely crack. Improper airflow is one of the big reasons why a heat exchanger is going to crack. Okay, and those are going to be caused by dirty air filters, closed off vents. Okay, furniture blocking return, return air vents or blocking supply vents. Those can contribute to improper airflow of your unit causing the system to work harder than it needs to. Remember, in HVAC, we are concerned with the movement of air in a space. So if that homeowner happens to block off the supply or return vent in a home or in a, in a, a room, we are now altering that 
furnace's ability to properly circulate the air throughout the space. And then by doing so, we are now creating an airflow issue. Okay, improper combustion of the gases is another cause for a premature heat exchanger to crack. Okay, it goes hand in hand with airflow restrictions. When your burners are not firing proper, they can run hotter or at a lower efficiency than that unit is actually designed for. Okay, so it's important to make sure that you are having the proper manifold pressure, three and a half inches of water column for natural gas, okay? You need to make sure that the furnace blower is running at the proper speed, okay? Doing CFM calculation if needed to make sure that you are running at the right speed. Improper displacement of condensation is another reason why, because it's going to cause rust. Because remember, a condensing furnace needs is going to have water vapor. That water that is in the heat exchanger needs to drain out. If it's not draining out, it's going to rot out the heat exchanger. Okay, so therefore it's going to make it rot out much faster. Okay, the life of the heat exchanger can be anywhere between uh, 20 years or so if proper maintenance and everything is working correctly. Okay, gas packs and, or gas package units are known to wear out faster than other units since they are exposed to weather and susceptible to heat and cooling and most importantly condensation uh, on, on these types of units. Rooftop units especially is what's really what we're talking about here, are really susceptible to premature uh, heat exchanger failure. They're up on a roof. They're in the hot sun. They're in the cold. Okay, A lot of our rooftop units are going to have both gas, heat, and air conditioning in them. So the, the heat exchanger is exposed to both uh, environments and they do tend to crack. Here's an example of a heat exchanger that is actually cracked. One of the big telltale signs that it was going to crack, look at the heat stress. Okay, That's all heat stress right there. That heat exchanger was heating up in this particular area for quite some time and then eventually it, it gave way. This heat exchanger was also going to crack right here. You can start seeing that rust that's happening. Another right here. This is a nice little crack. But notice there is no real sign of heat stress here. Okay, This was most likely caused by that metal constantly expanding and contracting over and over and over again and eventually it just cracked. Okay, This was probably on a maybe a rooftop unit where we had that air conditioning and the heat going back and forth, that hot and cold, eventually causing that metal to just wear out and crack. Here's another example of a cracked heat exchanger. This guy here has got some pinholes going on. Got a pinhole leak there. Well, we got a little bit of a bigger one going on right here. And this guy, this tube was also going to start to uh, deteriorate. Okay. So you got to look for stuff like that. Usually anytime you see uh, any rust or any sort of discoloration on there, you might want to maybe take a screwdriver or something and maybe just tap that area to see if it's weak or anything like that. But you really should give a good visual inspection on heat exchangers. Okay, so diagnosing improper airflow. Since airflow is a possible cause for cracking a heat exchanger, it is good practice to take airflow measurements. Okay, to diagnose an airflow problem, you need to do a couple of things. First, you need to take a temperature reading of your supply air. Then you need to take a temperature reading of your return air. You are going to subtract those two readings from each other to get a delta T, or a temperature difference. Okay, you are then going to use the output BTU from the nameplate into the following formula. Okay, so output BTU divided by 1.08 times your delta T. That is the formula you're going to use to figure out what your CFMs are for this particular unit. 
you're going to compare the calculated values against the recommended values of the manufacturer. Okay, check your delta, t your temperature rise or your delta T against the temperature rise on the nameplate. Okay, if you look at a nameplate on a gas fire furnace, there will be a little section in there that will tell you what the temperature rise should be. It could be 40 to 90 degrees. It could be 50 to 120 degrees. Whatever that nameplate temperature rise is, we're going to compare that to what we are reading. Okay, temperature rise is the difference between your supply air and your return air temperatures. What about this? Do you think this would cause an airflow problem? Do you think this would cause a crack in a heat exchanger? Absolutely. What is the blower's job in a heating and air conditioning system? Its job is to move air. Okay, blower, blower, our, our blower wheels and the fins are shaped in a, like almost like a cup, like this. So as that motor spins, we want that fan to take that air and throw it through the system and out our supply. If our fins on our blowers get as dirty as this and start to cake up, that blower is no longer able to throw the air like we would normally want it to. And when we do that, we are going to have a different temperature rise across the heat exchanger. Since we're not able to move the air properly, the temperature rise is going to go up. And if it goes up, we are now putting more stress on the heat exchanger itself and now making it more susceptible to cracks in heat stress and eventual failure. What about this? This is another thing that you may not want to see. Okay, We do not want to be blocking off vents. This must be open. Do not block. Okay, Vents are put into ductwork for a reason. Okay, reasons such as this, well, maybe this person uh, needed to put a little bit of heat downstairs. Okay, so they cut a, a hole into the supply of the side of the ductwork to dump a little bit of heat into maybe the basement. Or maybe the uh, person went on to YouTube and decided to do a little research on their own because they were having a problem with the furnace over, overheating or tripping a limit. So they found out that, you know what, it's not moving enough air. It's not releasing enough air. So they go and they decide to cut a hole into the side of the ductwork. But yet the technician that comes out says, oh, no, you can't do this. So he decides, because he's not exactly very smart himself, decides to take, puts a piece of cardboard between the hole in the, the grill to remedy the situation. Okay, needless to end of the line, any sort of vent that is on a piece of ductwork or on a furnace or any port of air conditioning, HVAC equipment, it should not be blocked. It needs to be open. It needs to be able to suck in the air to bring it back to the furnace or it needs to be open so that it can blow the air into the space. You need to be checking your blowers to make sure that you are using the proper CFMs using the given formula. You need to also be physically checking heat exchangers to make sure that they are not cracked or showing any signs of stress. If they are, you need to document that on any sort of service ticket and any sort of paperwork that is needed so in order to cover your rear end, okay, CYA, because if you don't and something is to happen, you are the last one to touch it, you own it. 